So in the first video, we talked about covalency and then also its effects on solubility in nonpolar organic solvents. But I just want to uh, write down for you what we talked about on Monday, which is that covalency also has an effect on kind of intermolecular interactions and the ultimate properties of a substance. Uh, so if you remember, we talked about kind of our different aluminum trihalides. So we talked about ALF3, which we said was very ionic because of that big delta chi, uh, compared to aluminum tribromide, which was more covalent because the delta chi is smaller. And then so that's more molecular. So uh, I just wanted to kind of make sure that you have the, the picture in mind, which is that as we go from more ionic to covalent, I don't want you to memorize hard and fast numbers, but I want you to realize that it's a continuum. So for an ionic situation, you know, for example, like uh, a metal or something like that, or a semiconductor, that kind of thing. Uh, what we have is when we have a big difference between our two electronegativities, so the more ionic bond, what we have are localized charges. So this is A plus, B minus. And then so this will be an identical interaction if you just stack infinitely. So we can form a 3D lattice, for example. And then we could you know, keep on building it up because we have just charges and they're electrostatically attracted to each other. And then we can form our lattice. Um, in contrast, on the other end, what we have is if we have a very covalent bond, so here we're sharing our electrons very equally, what this means is that instead of having our you know, very localized charges, if anything, a polar, polar covalent bond, we only have these, this small delta plus, small delta minus. And then so an intermolecular interaction in any, with a neighboring molecule, so we might still be somewhat polar. So what I mentioned in class is that this interaction over here would be pretty weak. So weak intermolecular interaction. And then the result was that, so the more covalent uh, molecular form of aluminum tribromide, which was the dimer, Al2Br6, this is, has a melting point that's you know, very accessible uh, and very low compared to this one, which had a melting point of like, I think, 1200 degrees. So it's whether, how easily we can break the intermolecular interaction. So again, with small partial charges, it's going to be very, very difficult, or sorry, very easy to break those intermolecular interactions. We're going to maintain our AB bond. So we don't break, we still have intact aluminum bromide bonds. We're not getting free ions there. But in between the molecules themselves, they're less attracted. But like I said, it's a continuum. So not everything is either a free molecule or a 3D lattice. We mentioned one example, which is beryllium chloride, which is a polymer. So we could have some, some sort of like borderline thing. OK, sorry, covalent was molecule. Because you know, again, we have a continuum of delta chi's for electronegativity. So over here, we could maybe have a covalent polymer in between. And then so this is kind of borderline. And then so this situation would be if, you know, we still have our AB bond. It's still sharing its electron density primarily within itself. But if we have bigger delta pluses, bigger delta char or partial charges, then when we have our neighboring atom, or neighboring molecule, rather. Then we could form you know, an interaction between the two. So we could form a long chain, and then we could have our covalent polymer. So it's, that's you know, the difference. You can have multiple types of substances. So we'll see all of them as examples within this class. Um, and as we go on the PR table, things change, right? Depending on periodicity, our trends and electronegativity, that really affects the final properties of the compounds that we see, whether it's molecular or polymer or 3D.